The Candle by Count Leo Tolstoy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Claudia Salto. The Candle by Count Leo Tolstoy. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth but i say unto you that ye resist not evil st matthew verses thirty eight thirty nine it was in the time of serfdom many years before alexander the second's liberation of the sixty million serfs in eighteen hundred sixty two in those days the people were ruled by different kinds of lords there were not a few who remembering god treated their slaves in a humane manner and not as beasts of burden while there were others who were seldom known to perform a kind or generous action but the most barbarous and tyrannical of all were those former serfs who arose from the dirt and became princes it was this latter class who made life literally a burden to those who were unfortunate enough to come under their rule many of them had arisen from the ranks of the peasantry to become superintendents of noblemen's estates the peasants were obliged to work for their master a certain number of days each week there was plenty of land and water and the soil was rich and fertile while the meadows and forests were sufficient to supply the needs of both the peasants and their lord there was a certain nobleman who had chosen a superintendent from the peasantry on one of his other estates no sooner had the power to govern been vested in this newly made official than he began to practice the most outrageous cruelties upon the poor serfs who had been placed under his control although this man had a wife and two married daughters and was making so much money that he could have lived happily without transgressing in any way against either god or man yet he was filled with envy and jealousy and deeply sunk in sin michael Semyonovitch began his persecutions by compelling the peasants to perform more days of service on the estate every week than the laws obliged them to work he established a brickyard in which he forced the men and women to do excessive labor selling the bricks for his own profit on one occasion the overworked serfs sent a delegation to moscow to complain of their treatment to their lord but they obtained no satisfaction when the poor peasants returned disconsolate from the nobleman their superintendent determined to have revenge for their boldness in going above him for redress and their life and that of their fellow victims became worse than before it happened that among the serfs there were some very treacherous people who would falsely accuse their fellows of wrongdoing and sow seeds of discord among the peasantry whereupon michael would become greatly enraged while his poor subjects began to live in fear of their lives when the superintendent passed through the village the people would run and hide themselves as from a wild beast seeing thus the terror which he had struck to the hearts of the mujiks michael's treatment of them became still more vindictive so that from overwork and ill usage the lot of the poor serfs was indeed a hard one there was a time when it was possible for the peasants when driven to despair to devise means whereby they could rid themselves of an inhuman monster such as Simeonovich, and so these unfortunate people began to consider whether something could not be done to relieve them of their intolerable yoke 
they would hold little meetings in secret places to bewail their misery and to confer with one another as to which would be the best way to act now and then the boldest of the gathering would rise and address his companions in this strain how much longer can we tolerate such a villain to rule over us let us make an end of it at once for it were better for us to perish than to suffer it is surely not a sin to kill such a devil in human form it happened once before the easter holidays that one of these meetings was held in the woods where michael had sent the serfs to make a clearance for their master at noon they assembled to eat their dinner and to hold a consultation why can't we leave now said one very soon we shall be reduced to nothing already we are almost worked to death there being no rest night or day either for us or our poor women if anything should be done in a way not exactly to please him he will find fault and perhaps flog some of us to death as was the case with poor simeon whom he killed not long ago only recently any sim was tortured in irons till he died we certainly cannot stand this much longer yes said another what is the use of waiting let us act at once michael will be here this evening and will be certain to abuse us shamefully let us then thrust him from his horse and with one blow of an axe give him what he deserves and thus end our misery we can then dig a big hole and bury him like a dog and no one will know what became of him now let us come to an agreement to stand together as one man and not to betray one another the last speaker was vasily minayev who if possible had more cause to complain of michael's cruelty than any of his fellow serfs the superintendent was in the habit of flogging him severely every week and he took also vasily's wife to serve him as cook accordingly during the evening that followed this meeting in the woods michael arrived on the scene on horseback he began at once to find fault with the manner in which the work had been done and to complain because some lime trees had been cut down i told you not to cut down any lime trees shouted the enraged superintendent who did this thing tell me at once or i shall flog every one of you on investigation a peasant named sidor was pointed out as the guilty one and his face was roundly slapped michael also severely punished vasily because he had not done sufficient work after which the master rode safely home in the evening the serfs again assembled and poor vasily said oh what kind of people are we anyway we are only sparrows and not men at all we agree to stand by each other but as soon as the time for action comes we all run and hide once a lot of sparrows conspired against a hawk but no sooner did the bird of prey appear than they sneaked off in the grass. Selecting one of the choicest sparrows, the hawk took it away to eat, after which the others came out crying, Twee twee! and found that one was missing. Who is killed? they asked. Vanka! Well, he deserved it. You, my friends, are acting in just the same manner when michael attacked sidor you should have stood by your promise why didn't you arise and with one stroke put an end to him and to our misery the effect of this speech was to make the peasants more firm in their determination to kill their superintendent the latter had already given orders that they should be ready to plough during the easter holidays and to sow the field with oats 
whereupon the serfs became stricken with grief and gathered in Vasily's house to hold another indignation meeting. If he has really forgotten God, they said, and shall continue to commit such crimes against us, it is truly necessary that we should kill him. If not, let us perish, for it can make no difference to us now. This despairing program, however, met with considerable opposition from a peaceably inclined man named Peter Mikhaev. Brethren, said he, you are contemplating a grievous sin. The taking of human life is a very serious matter. Of course it is easy to end the mortal existence of a man, but what will become of the souls of those who commit the deed? If Michael continues to act toward us unjustly, God will surely punish him. But, my friends, we must have patience. This pacific utterance only served to intensify the anger of Vasily. Said he, Peter is forever repeating the same old story. It is a sin to kill anyone. Certainly it is sinful to murder, but we should consider the kind of man we are dealing with. We all know it is wrong to kill a good man, but even God would take away the life of such a dog as he is. It is our duty, if we have any love for mankind, to shoot a dog that is mad. It is a sin to let him live. If, therefore, we are to suffer it all, let it be in the interests of the people, and they will thank us for it. If we remain quiet any longer, a flogging will be our only reward. You are talking nonsense, Mikhaev. Why don't you think of the sin we shall be committing if we worked during the Easter holidays? For you will refuse to work then yourself? Well then, replied Peter, if they shall send me to plough, I will go but I shall not be going of my own free will, and God will know whose sin it is, and shall punish the offender accordingly. Yet we must not forget him. Brethren, I am not giving you my own views only. The law of God is not to return evil for evil. Indeed, if you try in this way to stamp out wickedness, it will come upon you all the stronger. It is not difficult for you to kill the man, but his blood will surely stain your own soul. You may think you have killed a bad man, that you have gotten rid of evil, but you will soon find out that the seeds of still greater wickedness have been planted within you. If you yield to misfortune, it will surely come to you. As Peter was not without sympathizers among the peasants, the poor serfs were consequently divided into two groups, the followers of Vasily and those who held the views of Mikhaev. On Easter Sunday, no work was done. Toward the evening, an elder came to the peasants from the nobleman's court and said, Our superintendent, Michael Simeonovich, orders you to go tomorrow to plough the field for the oats. Thus the official went through the village and directed the man to prepare for work the next day, some by the river and others by the roadway. The poor people were almost overcome with grief, many of them shedding tears, but none dared to disobey the orders of their master. On the morning of Easter Monday, while the church bells were calling the inhabitants to religious services, and while everyone else was about to enjoy a holiday, the unfortunate serfs started for the field to plough. Michael arose rather late and took a walk about the farm. 
the domestic servants were through with their work and had dressed themselves for the day while michael's wife and their widowed daughter who was visiting them as was her custom on holidays had been to church and returned a steaming samovar awaited them and they began to drink tea with michael who after lighting his pipe called the elder to him well said the superintendent have you ordered the mujiks to plough to-day yes sir i did was the reply have they all gone to the field yes sir all of them i directed them myself where to begin that is all very well you gave the orders but are they ploughing go at once and see and you may tell them that i shall be there after dinner i shall expect to find one and a half acres done for every two ploughs and the work must be well done otherwise they shall be severely punished notwithstanding the holiday i hear sir and obey the elder started to go but michael called him back after hesitating for some time as if he felt very uneasy he said by the way listen to what those scoundrels say about me doubtless some of them will curse me and i want you to report the exact words i know what villains they are they don't find work at all pleasant they would rather lie down all day and do nothing they would like to eat and drink and make merry on holidays but they forget that if the ploughing is not done it will soon be too late so you go and listen to what is said and tell it to me in detail go at once i hear sir and obey turning his back and mounting his horse the elder was soon at the field where the serfs were hard at work it happened that michael's wife a very good-hearted woman overheard the conversation which her husband had just been holding with the elder approaching him she said my good friend mishinka diminutive of michael i beg of you to consider the importance and solemnity of this holy day do not sin for christ's sake let the poor mujiks go home michael laughed but made no reply to his wife's humane request finally he said to her you've not been whipped for a very long time and now you have become bold enough to interfere in affairs that are not your own mishinka she persisted i have had a frightful dream concerning you you had better let the mujiks go yes said he i perceive that you have gained so much flesh of late that you think you would not feel the whip look out rudely thrusting his hot pipe against her cheek michael chased his wife from the room after which he ordered his dinner after eating a hearty meal consisting of cabbage soup roast pig meat cake pastry with milk jelly sweet cakes and vodka he called his woman cook to him and ordered her to be seated and sing songs simeonovitch accompanying her on the guitar while the superintendent was thus enjoying himself to the fullest satisfaction in the musical society of his cook the elder returned and making a low bow to his superior proceeded to give the desired information concerning the serfs well asked michael did they plough yes replied the elder they have accomplished about half the field is there no fault to be found not that i could discover the work seems to be well done they are evidently afraid of you how is the soil very good it appears to be quite soft well said simeonovitch after a pause what did they say about me 
curse me, I suppose. As the elder hesitated somewhat, Michael commanded him to speak and tell him the whole truth. Tell me all, said he. I want to know their exact words. If you tell me the truth, I shall reward you. But if you conceal anything from me, you will be punished. See here, Catherine, pour out a glass of vodka to give him courage. After drinking to the health of his superior, the elder said to himself, It is not my fault if they do not praise him. I shall tell him the truth. Then, turning suddenly to the superintendent, he said, They complain, Michael Simeonovitch, they complain bitterly. But what did they say? demanded Michael. Tell me. Well, one thing they said was, He does not believe in God. Michael laughed. Who said that? he asked. It seemed to be the unanimous opinion. He has been overcome by the evil one, they said. Very good, laughed the superintendent. But tell me what each of them said. What did Vasily say? The elder did not wish to betray his people, but he had a certain grudge against Vasily, and he said, He cursed you more than did any of the others. But what did he say? It is awful to repeat it, sir. Vasily said, He shall die like a dog, having no chance to repent. Oh, the villain, exclaimed Michael. He would kill me if he were not afraid. All right, Vasily, we shall have an accounting with you. And Tishka, he called me a dog, I suppose. Well, said the elder, they all spoke of you in anything but complimentary terms, but it is mean in me to repeat what they said. Mean or not, you must tell me, I say. Some of them declared that your back should be broken. Simeonovitch appeared to enjoy this immensely, for he laughed outright. We shall see whose back will be the first to be broken, said he. Was there Tishka's opinion? While I did not suppose they would say anything good about me, I did not expect such curses and threats. And Peter Mikhaev, was that fool cursing me too? No, he did not curse you at all. He appeared to be the only silent one among them. Mikhaev is a very wise mujik, and he surprises me very much. At his actions, all the other peasants seemed amazed. What did he do? He did something remarkable. He was diligently ploughing, and as I approached him, I heard someone singing very sweetly. Looking between the ploughshares, I observed a bright object shining. Well, what was it? Hurry up! It was a small five kopeck wax candle, burning brightly, and the wind was unable to blow it out. Peter, wearing a new shirt, sang beautiful hymns as he ploughed, and no matter how he handled the implement, the candle continued to burn. In my presence, he fixed the plough, shaking it violently but the bright little object between the coulters remained undisturbed. And what did Mikhaev say? He said nothing, except when, on seeing me, he gave me the holy day salutation, after which he went on his way, singing and ploughing as before. I did not say anything to him, but on approaching the other mujiks, I found that they were laughing and making sport of their silent companion. 
"'It is a great sin to plough on Easter Monday,' they said. "'You could not get absolution from your sin "'if you were to pray all your life.' "'And did Mikhaev make no reply?' He stood long enough to say, There should be peace on earth and good will to men, after which he resumed his ploughing and singing, the candle burning even more brightly than before. Simeonovitch had now ceased to ridicule, and putting aside his guitar, his head dropped on his breast, and he became lost in thought. Presently he ordered the elder and cook to depart, after which Michael went behind a screen and threw himself upon the bed. He was sighing and moaning, as if in great distress, when his wife came in and spoke kindly to him. He refused to listen to her, exclaiming, "'He has conquered me, and my end is near!' Mishinka, said the woman, arise and go to the Mujiks in the field. Let them go home, and everything will be all right. Heretofore you have run far greater risks without any fear, but now you appear to be very much alarmed. He has conquered me, he repeated. I am lost. What do you mean? demanded his wife angrily. If you will go and do as I tell you, there will be no danger. Come, Mishinka, she added tenderly, I shall have the saddle horse brought for you at once. When the horse arrived, the woman persuaded her husband to mount the animal and to fulfill her request concerning the serfs. When he reached the village, a woman opened the gate for him to enter, and as he did so, the inhabitants, seeing the brutal superintendent whom everybody feared, ran to hide themselves in their houses, gardens, and other secluded places. At length, Michael reached the other gate, which he found closed also, and, being unable to open it himself while seated on his horse, he called loudly for assistance. As no one responded to his shouts, he dismounted and opened the gate, but as he was about to remount and had one foot in the stirrup, the horse became frightened at some pigs and sprang suddenly to one side. The superintendent fell across the fence, and a very sharp picket pierced his stomach, when Michael fell unconscious to the ground. Toward the evening, when the serfs arrived at the village gate, their horses refused to enter. On looking around, the peasants discovered the dead body of their superintendent lying face downward in a pool of blood, where he had fallen from the fence. Peter Mikhaev alone had sufficient courage to dismount and approach the prostrate form, his companions riding around the village and entering by way of the back yards. Peter closed the dead man's eyes, after which he put the body in a wagon and took it home. When the nobleman learned of the fatal accident which had befallen his superintendent and of the brutal treatment which he had meted out to those under him, he freed the serfs, exacting a small rent for the use of his land and the other agricultural opportunities, and thus the peasants clearly understood that the power of God is manifested not in evil, but in goodness. End of The Candle by Count Leo Tolstoy